It's the best thing ever to be on this show. Really amazing experience to be a part of. A friend of mine was on set today, and she goes, how are you doing? And I said, good. She goes, yeah, you're in denial. I think you're just blocking it all out. I cried all last night, so I'm trying to put a, a damper on the, uh, on the eyes today. I'm going to be a mess on the last day. I'm glad we're doing this DVD interview <laughs> before the end. It's my baby, and I knew that, you know, I, I will never have an opportunity like this again. There may be other series, but there will never be something like Desperate Housewives. Something about this show from the very beginning, I think Felicity said it one year, it was lightning in a bottle. And I remember Marsha Cross sitting in my trailer going, our lives are about to change. And I said, why would they change? What's going to change? And then, boom, the show exploded and everything changed. For an actress, it changed the game. Now women over 40 were allowed to be sexy, in charge, not have to be a lawyer or a police person wearing a uniform. They were hot women that were housewives and businesswomen, women in a community. Mark was saying, you know, eight years ago, none of us knew that Marsha was going to have twins and get married, or Eva was going to end up in the White House, or I was going to be on the next Dallas. You know, there's, or Felicity was going to get nominated for an Academy Award, and, and Terry, you know, built a company. We all have had our lives exponentially expand because of this show, and there's nothing but gratitude. It may never get better than I've had it right here. This has been this unbelievably fantastic experience. When you're given a gift like that, you want to cherish it and take care of it. Susan, vulnerable. Lovable. Attractive. Vulnerable. I think she's vulnerable. What you doing? Lock myself out, naked. So how are you? She had been so wanting to, to fall in love and meet someone. I'm Mike Delfino. I just started renting The Sims house next door. Susan Meyer, I live across the street. I think killing off Mike, you know, who from the beginning was, that was the fairy tale romance that she wanted to come true, brought back that vulnerable side for her. But it also, I think, showed how much stronger she's gotten. I know that Terry has really fought to find the strength in that character and to not make it a tragedy, to not make it that this character's legacy is now that she's sad and alone the rest of her life. Because that would be a disservice to the beautiful character that was created and the beautiful character that Terry brought to life. Hey, do you guys mind if I take one last spin around the block? Go for it. I think I tried to maintain some authentic, grounded base of who that character was at her core. Having Terry Hatcher come to the set, you know, she's gone over my script that I've read, and she's got all these notes and thoughts, and she's clearly put tons of time into it, and suddenly she's making the scene better because, she, you know, she has so much insight into Susan. You know, and I suddenly realized, wow, you, you love this show as much as I do. Yes, I like that. Okay, yeah. Okay. Mark has been an amazing showrunner. His mind fires on so many different levels. He is funny with the most amazing timing and really honest. Mark Cherry has given me the best eight professional years of my life. I will be forever indebted to him. The thing I am most proud of is that I came up with it in the first place. I was an unemployed writer over the age of 40. My career had basically stopped, and I was, to use an adjective, desperate to reinvent myself. I remember on the pilot, he was so far in the background that we'd kind of go, who's the writer? Oh, it's that guy? Cut to eight years later when, you know, he comes onto the set and sort of says, this is how I want it shot from this angle. He was on the set every single day for every single scene. What he learned over the last eight years is when you have the strength of your own convictions, it is easier to lead the group into battle. And I just realized we need some kind of response because we're going to be hearing her laughter. Oh, I know. So, so you're going to be, so you'll be saying to her, absolutely, joining in the fun. I kind of had made a promise to the women, you know, that I'm going to be here. I'm going to be a caretaker. I'm going to oversee this as much as I can. And he was able to really carry us that whole time um, and maintain the integrity of the writing and, and the characters. 
Lynette, exasperated. The first word that came to mind was frazzled. All right. <laughs> Challenged. The mother of four, uh, all under the age of seven. Yeah, right. Hey, we're here. I know. We've had so many facets of that character that have been demonstrated over the seasons. I don't think you could describe Lynette with like one or two words or one sentence. They've just written wonderful things, I have to say, for Lynette, and I am constantly in the writer's debt for that. You know, people would come up to me in airports. They liked Lynette, but it was also, she's a bitch. Ooh, she's hard on Tom. Your hands smell like cheese. <laughs> he goes to school. I don't want you to go to school. He quits school. I can't believe you quit school. He starts a job. That's not a good enough job. He gets a better job. Now you're working too much. Ta-da! What is this? It's your dream house. Ow. What the hell's wrong with you? You don't just buy someone a house. Lynette's been one of my favorite characters to write because she's faced such a real, real dilemma, which is the push and pull of the working mom. I think you might have forgotten something. I was on the phone. I was talking to my new boss, and I... You got a lot on your mind. Three kids and a newborn. Sounds like a new job. Yeah, I do. It's a lot to handle. Before, she was fighting externally, and this year, she's been fighting internally and has finally had a sea change in terms of how she holds the world. Don't ever forget. Always remember how much you wanted to be loved and how much you are loved. People care deeply about this relationship. That's good and that's important because I think we need a positive um, reflection uh, of what marriage is and can be and should be. Yeah, this does seem like a nice place. I think it's nice that Lynette was kind of able to have it all at the end, because that's been her, her struggle for eight years. Wisteria Lane is one of those places where everything is idyllic, and people love to escape there. We're probably the first television series that ever really had an actual neighborhood as a character like this, from the way that our art directors and our gardeners and everyone has constructed this place. It really became just a vividly powerful symbol of suburban America and has been an invaluable tool in terms of telling these stories. Lots of stuff's happened on Wisteria Lane. Tornadoes and plane crashes and, uh, you know, uh, riots. There's something about being on this street on Wisteria Lane that's so self-contained that you really do feel like you're in your own little special world. One day when I first started, I mailed a letter in the mailbox on the street, and one of the prop guys said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm mailing a letter. He said, that's not a real mailbox. <laughs> but it looks just like a real mailbox. And the gutters are real gutters, and the sidewalks are made out of real cement, so sometimes you forget it's not a real street. From the beginning, it is, it is tapped into what people think Americans are in the suburbs and what sometimes they are in the suburbs. And I think people know these people. It's a community. It's lives that are connected, people who care about each other. That's beautiful. Now, back to Ms. Perry. I know it sounds sappy, but damn it, it's true. You want to be on that street. You want to walk around those houses, be with those people on that little cul-de-sac for a little bit of time each week. Bree Vandekamp repressed. Lonely. Tight. Facade. I'd say lost. I would say Brie has changed the most over the years, in particular the last two seasons. You know, she's sort of gotten away from the, the rigid, prim, proper woman. Does he have spots on his legs? He has to have spots on his legs. Well, you're good with crafts. You can stencil some on later. Ah! Oh, damn it! She hit the comedy and the drama. <laughs> wow! And walked that fine line. And when you've experienced the humor that comes from her character and yet the humility that comes from her, then I always think that's, those are good days and good scenes for me. Have you ever been here before? Once. I think it's been fun for Marsha to, to play that because I think, you know, there's only so long you can play that sort of perfect Martha Stewart character. We've taken the character on so many amazing journeys. I think we find her a much more aware character. I was in a dark place. Lonely, 
And in pain, I started drinking again. I think she's more integrated. Slowly, over time, she's had to kind of wake up and wake up and wake up and wake up. From oblivious to aware, that's what I see Brie Vandekamp's journey as. Gabrielle, spoiled. Hot. Tamale. Expensive. Materialistic, greedy, manipulative. I've had such a fun time playing Gabby because she's had this amazing arc throughout the series. And she's sacrificed a lot for her marriage and for her children. And so that's just a totally different person than that we started with. But yet she still has Gabby in her. She's still feisty and a spitfire and says and does things that people wish they could say and do and she can get away with it. Mm. We're gonna get through this, okay? Oh, and do me a favor. If it turns out you are an alcoholic, promise you won't be one of those whiny ones. The character grew. You know, Eva created this amazing character that was still full of herself, very cognizant of her beauty, driven to do horrible things. But boy, because of the intelligence that she approached that character and because of her ability to do both comedy and drama, it really morphed into a much deeper character than I think I had even envisioned at the beginning. I miss my life. I'm lonely all the time. And I could really use some friends. My opinion on Gabby and Carlos they were people that had no idea what the foundations were of a relationship at all. And the biggest thing that they have now is that they have a lot of love and respect for each other. Cut. Great. Check it out. Thank you. Next game. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm most proud of the legacy we are leaving in television to have a show with four powerful, dynamic women telling the story of the contemporary housewife, the contemporary woman, the contemporary wife, the contemporary mother, contemporary friend. I see you're 25, and I raise you 50. I know you're bluffing. How? For the last 10 years, every time you have a bad hand, you tap the side of your glass. No, I don't. Yeah. You do. You totally do. Absolutely. I have a tell and you guys never told me? I'm proud of just the volume, <laughs> you know, showing up and doing your best every day for a lot of years. Well, believe it or not, after eight years, I think I'm finally starting to hone in on what it takes to do a comedic scene. Well, here's the thing. 20 minutes and you lose a button. Can you, Catherine? That's the thing. So that's a big one just in terms of my work. Um, also, just in terms of my work, that always less is more. I'm about to fly off to Paris, and you're inviting boys over for Oktoberfest. Ugh, that's it. Go to your room and finish packing. This conversation's over. Terry and I have worked very hard at creating the relationship that Susan and Julie have. It's something that we've tried to cultivate over all eight years, and we've always tried to be as honest and as truthful as we can. What the hell was that? He was flirting with you. I don't need you to fix me up. Even single mothers have needs. Childbirth can't possibly be as painful as this conversation. Can we stay in your basement? Who exactly is we? That family you've come to know and love. I only love four of you. I think I contributed a good bit to getting Mrs. McCluskey real. The people who watch the show felt that she was real. And I'm very proud of having created that kind of a character who's not phony or stereotypical. I may not be your biggest fan or even like you, but there's one thing no one can argue with. You are hot. I'm gonna miss watching these four unbelievably talented women. I mean, the whole cast, but in particular, these four women taking on these roles and doing some of the most amazing scenes I've ever seen in my life. And we don't need to say goodbye anyway, because we're going to see you real soon. And everything will be just the way it was. The show's still alive. It's not until it's actually gone that I think the real dazed and confused and painful part will really hit. I'm going to miss the routine, miss coming to work every day and not seeing the same faces. Joking around with Felicity Huffman, 
who's this brilliant actress, but, you know, is totally capable of doing horrible practical jokes. You know, listening to Eva Longoria laugh. <laughs> Just getting to know Marsha Cross. Having Terry Hatcher come to the set, you know, she's gone over my script that I've read, and she's got all these notes and insight into Susan. I'm going to miss the ladies. I'm going to miss hanging out with Eva. I'm going to miss Marcia's kind eyes, asking Vanessa basically anything, and you, she comes up with an answer from who's the best person to do your eyebrows to what about the War of 1812? I don't know how she does it. I've known these people since I was 11 years old. It's going to be a very odd thing to not see them all the time, but I'll also miss Julie. I'll miss my character. Um, I'm getting emotional, sorry. Do we have any tissues? <laughs> I'm gonna miss having an opportunity to look at the fragility and the humor and the beauty and the insanity that is humanity and being able to comment on it. God, I'm gonna cry. I didn't think that was gonna happen. Of all the things I'll take away, the relationships and the wonderful people that I've had the opportunity to work with, I feel really fortunate that these people all came together to do this show and I was part of it. I doubt that I will ever be around a crew that is as wonderful and as professional and as just a sincere group of people as the people that have been working on Housewives for the past eight years. And as I pulled up at the gates, I shook the hand of both security guards and I started to tell them how thankful I was for how great they always were to me, any guests that I had, and I just started bawling. Cut. You look fantastic. One more, let's reset. Very nice, just like that. We just function like a family. I know it sounds a little cliche. I've come on after seven years, and these guys have been together for so long. Their relationships are very strong. It's like graduating from college. You know, you're kind of glad to be leaving, but at the same time, there's a lot of nostalgia. And you get to know each other, and, and I'm going to miss them. They're part of the work family that's now dissolving. Eight years up here. It's been a fabulous place to work. I mean, where else can you sit among all these beautiful artificial flowers and the beautiful weather? That's my workspace. Everybody I talk to just says how great it has been to work on the show and how much everybody has wanted to stay here and be here. So that says a lot about your creators, your writers, and your ladies who are setting the tone every day, that, that people are happy to be here and work. I wish I could bottle uh, the laughter on set. It's the joy, it's just fun. But we just laugh our asses off every day in that writer's room, and I'm gonna miss that probably most of all. Moments of just, you know, connecting with other professionals and getting to do what it is we all wanna do, which is, you know, play for a living. And oh, did we play. <laughs>